and I'll just say, uh, so welcome to the SATA webinar, Diane Salters, uh, delighted that you're with us. Um, over to you. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, SATAA is dear to my heart. And um, so is this topic. And um, I will be um, my contracting with you for taking care of your own learning, please take responsibility, ask the questions you need to ask. Um, there will be specific time set aside for questions. And there will also be time in the breakout rooms. Um, if that's what we decide to do, I'll consult with you all whether you'd rather discuss as a whole group or go into breakout rooms at various points. And we will take a short comfort break at around three o'clock. Um, and I do have a list of references for you, which I've just reminded Kirsty to remind me about, but I've remembered. And uh, I, those, I, those can be emailed to you subsequently. <clears throat> so um, let me get my screen share working appropriately. And I want to go to slideshow. Right. So my topic for today is what does TA as a social psychology contribute to our understanding of power? My experience of working with many different groups and people over many years is that there are those who love power. These are those who are afraid of power. And there are those who are attracted to power. And I'm interested in looking at the, some of the dynamics of that and why it's important to us as citizens of the world and as transactional analysts. So my question to myself, and I'm putting it to, out there today for all of us, what is my responsibility as a person and a professional understand and address the healthy and unhealthy use of power. I believe we do have a responsibility and I'll say why later, but what is it and how do we do it? And what is healthy and unhealthy use of power? These are all the questions that we're going to be um, taking time to discuss together. So we will look at the nature of power, the abuse of power, and the authentic and effective use of power. More or less in that order, but not necessarily, they'll be kind of mixed up together. So let me go back one. First of all, before looking closely at any definitions of power, <clears throat> I want to look a little bit at TA as a social psychology. Rick Byrne began it as a social psychology. It was how do people interact? It was transactional analysis, not only the analysis of ego states and um, script and all of those things. It really was important how people transacted with each other. And he also began it as a very serious challenge to the authority and power of the American Psychoanalytic Association, of which he was being analyzed and seeking uh, registration with them, which he never achieved, by the way. And part of the reason, I think, was because he was a real rebel in terms of the um, analytic world and had a, a resistance to keeping people in analysis for years and years and years and seeing what he called improvement he wanted, he called cure, which isn't always used these days, but it's interesting that he did. And he wanted people to be empowered and to get back to living healthy lives as quickly as they could. He talked about famously about the one session cure. And the, so that was a very serious challenge to the, to the establishment way of thinking at the time. And in the hospital that he worked in, he instructed students, trainees, other clinicians, that they, any client um, 
presentations that they made, case presentations, had to be presented in terms that the patients would understand just as well as the doctors. And moreover, the patients were encouraged to give their own feedback after the ward rounds on the behavior and the conclusions and the insights of the doctors, which again was a very radical way of uh, empowering patients. And a key person who soon joined uh, Eric Byrne and formed the radical psychiatry group was Claude Steiner, who was very interested in power, people's alienation from power, particularly both personal and political. He was the one who identified the big parent as the internal oppressor in the individual psyche. And he also added potency, healthy use of power to Pat Crossman's permission and protection diet. She originally only had two and he added potency. And he continued to write about power throughout his life. So I'm going to start and finish this lecture with Steiner, taking in some other authors and concepts along the way. So let's look at some definitions. The definition that Steiner offers us is personal power is best defined as the capacity to produce change. You can reflect on that. But I think it's certainly in terms of transactional analysis, when we're thinking about script change and the people come to us for the most part seeking change, um, it's a pretty good definition. Social power is cited by Robert Massey, who's another TA um, author, he cites Clark, saying the force or energy required to bring about, to sustain or prevent social, political or economic change how he defines social power. And there it's quite interesting because it's not only about bringing about change, but very crucially about preventing change. Um, the status quo often supports those people who have at some point in the past managed to gain power, often power over others, and therefore the resistance to change can sometimes be quite strong. I'm going to talk very briefly about autonomy and homonymy. I'm not going to spend time on it because that's really a whole presentation on its own. I simply want to say that autonomy is really the exercise of personal power, individuation and personal choice and personal power. And it is cited as one of the key aims in PA psychotherapy, certainly in other fields of TA as well. And more recently that has been challenged by homonymy. I think to some extent it was always recognized in TA in so far as we talk about script, um, cultural scripts and strokes and the need for recognition. But it's that need to belong. That need to belong is so powerful people will often give up all autonomy if it fe feels as though that might threaten their ability to belong. So the extent to which they will exercise their personal power, their autonomy, is in large measure dependent on the context that either gives permission for that or does not give permission for that. They can belong and use their personal power they will. If they have to make a choice, they may give up their personal power. I think that's quite an important thing to hold in mind as we carry on. This is just to allow you to breathe in between and enjoy the scent of the lovely friend to party. Um, the Another way of looking at power, and I don't really honestly know where I got this from. Years and years ago, I came across it and I have no idea of the source. So if anybody knows, they can inform me. You can experience yourself as being overpowered, 
underpowered or empowered in various contexts. Overpowered either by a person or a circumstances, underpowered in being under-resourced or prevented from exercising your power, or empowered in terms of um, being enabled to use the power that you have, the personal power and the group, the power within a group. Equally, of course, you can yourself do the same to others. You can overpower others, your client, your trainees, or your family. You can underpower them in terms of withholding information or knowledge. You can empower them by sharing knowledge and by giving permissions for um, the exercise of personal power. So I think those are um, very um, important things to consider when looking at ourselves in, as transactional analysts. How do we experience ourselves as overpowered, underpowered, or empowered? And likewise with our clients. I'm going to come to the next slide later. And I think this would be a good chance to have some questions um, and some discussion. So do people want to go into smaller rooms or are we a small enough group that we discuss this as a whole? What are your views? You indicate. I'd say we, we're small enough to stay in the... In one group? Yeah. Okay. Um, I can offer you enough cases from my personal life that I can keep you here for the next couple of hours. <laughs> so, it rests with me. What's your thinking, Karen? I think uh, if we, we contract for time to share and stay in the big group, there's probably a richness in mm. here. All the voices hearing but, from everyone. I think. Okay. Well, if we if we set aside um, next ten minutes, say, to reflect on situations that people have experienced, I'm going to change my view. I think to speaker okay. view, so that I can see who's. You can stop sharing, though, as well. I'm going to stop sharing, yes. There we go. And change. I'll keep it on gallery. I can still see who's raising their hand or whatever. I have some thoughts. Um, that it might be appropriate for a person to not yet have power. And that might be either seen as them being underpowered for a temporary period or not yet empowered. For instance, if that which would give them power is not something they're competent in, it's probably a good idea to keep them and other people safe by not yet giving them the full power of that thing, whatever it is, knowledge, a skill, true yeah i i think like uh, regulation yeah no, i i see your point we 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 do this for children for uh, people who are not yet competent at something and i think that's an interesting um interesting question about whether that's a limit on their power or a limit on their exercise of their skills in a certain circumstance, but it might be perceived as a uh, limitation on their power. Hmm. Other thoughts? I think that the Zoom room lends itself to all sorts of new complexities in power. 
because as a facilitator in a Zoom room, you actually have technical powers of a great kind. And I have been facilitating in the Zoom room for the past year and found the experience incredibly, incredibly challenging. And I could bring up all sorts of incidents from my personal experience of how to um, keep you know, you know, the, the necessary, relay, the best way of giving people the freedom to contribute, but actually how do you take power away from the participants without belittling them. In a Zoom room, you can take the power away straight away, but how do you do it, the skill of doing it and allowing the participants to retain their integrity, I think is a very rich subject for discussion. Mm. I mean, I could give you an example like, um, so at the beginning of a meeting, so this happened this week, I was facilitator. There were about 14 people in the meeting and our opening salvo was to speak to a certain point for two minutes. And most people keep to the two minutes, but one particular individual not only didn't keep to the two minutes, but brought up topic that was totally inappropriate but I wasn't able to discipline her the way I would have liked to have I think eventually I did cut her short but the way I'd love to learn some skills about how to use that power without um, insulting the person who is speaking Mm-hmm. It's a very important questions, Grace, and the um, one of the most frustrating things is to be in a meeting or facilitation where the chairperson or the facilitator doesn't exercise their authority, Absolutely. because they do have some authority, and that comes with a certain kind of power, and if they don't exercise it, um, it everything falls apart, and that's why I said at the beginning, some people want to seize power and some people are very afraid of using their power, even when they're sitting in a chairperson's role. They won't exercise the power or authority that they do have and back off from it. Hmm. And I'm, actually, no, go on, Karen. Our time up, done. No, no, Karen. Um, I'm I'm fascinated by um, that we've all got we've got individual power and social power, and almost how they interlink. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering um, along the lines of Ken Wilber's lines of developments, are we perhaps more uh, what's the word more grounded in our power in some contexts more than others, or is it a who we are is who we are, or is it, you know, is it impacted by the group we're functioning in, where we might feel, uh, we might move to feel um, underempowered or claim mm. to demonstrate we're overpowering. Mm. It's a new thought for me. Mm. I have no idea mm. what to do with it, but mm. fascinating me. Very interesting thought. Anybody got any response to that? Um, I'm thinking about it. And I'm thinking of an, of an example of um, two young women that I'm working with at the moment. Uh, they're both people of color, one South African, one UK. And they were talking about how they, very able women, top achievers, university, college, law school, you know, much. and yet one of them in particular got a job in the city um, in a very white male situation. And she instantly felt all her power drain away. 
and was trying to figure out why and how and what. Um, although she is in her context, in her other work and in her achievements at college and so on, very powerful. Um, so I think the context does matter. And I think our early childhood experiences matter. If you've been from a very young age told that you were less important because you were a woman um, or less valuable because you were black or something, that is going to influence your internal locus of power. And particularly when you find in a situ yourself in a situation that overtly challenges it. Sorry, I see Sh Sheetal has a hand up. Oh, thank you. Hi. Thank you, Sheetal. Um, I think what was sparked off for me by what you said, Karen, was the attachment to our own awareness as we develop can also be a source of overpowering others. So I was thinking around, you know, the developmental lines and, you know, as we, as we become aware that we can hold more and more complexity, and I become attached to the ego of that, um, I can use that to overpower another person. It was just mm. an interesting thought that occurred to me. Mm. Yes, thank you. Mm. Yep. I'm sitting with the definition of personal power being about our capacity to bring about change. Mm. I've never thought about it that way. I've always thought about personal power as being able to use my voice, but I guess that definition almost takes it a step back to say, why am I using my voice? What for? Mm. Um, so at first I felt almost limited by the definition because I was like, would I only, is, that, is it just about that? <laughs> um, but actually the more I think and sit with it, it it kind of opens it up a little bit to be like, well, why do I need to use my voice? And yeah, is that really the purpose of it all <laughs> to keep changing and evolving? I'm yeah. smiling because that was exactly my reaction when I read it. What is that all? <laughs> but the more I thought about it, the more I thought anything that I do changes something. You know, I have the power to pick up this glass and drink it. I change the world around me. I change my body. Um, mm. it's quite interesting mm. yeah. Yeah. Diane, um, yes Johan I was just wondering how would you define the essence of power I don't know if there's an essence of power the two definitions that I offered you are about the ability to make change happen somewhere, either personally or in the world around us. And so perhaps if then one was going to go to essence, I would say it's, it's energy. It's something about psychological energy or physical energy to pick up this glass and do something with it or psychological energy to... Um, I mean, some people can overpower just with a look. They don't have to say anything. I had a teacher like that once. <laughs> um, yeah, I think yeah. the energy is, uh, is for me, uh, a kind of uh, triggers for me quite strongly. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it might be energy? Mm. Mm. Do you want to say more about that, Johan? Well, it's, uh, it's very much what you're saying is that, uh, you know, you, I work with teams and, and uh, sometimes you have a, a group of eight people uh, sitting in a room uh, having a discussion and then the, the uh, shall we call it, the, the, the person who has been put in charge of the team by the organization walks in a bit later and suddenly there's a different atmosphere in the group. And that mm. person hasn't said anything. Mm. It's mm. almost as if you have a sense of, oh, what have we got now? Uh, there's silence, mm -hmm. and there's people looking around and uh, it's mm -hmm. almost like an uneasiness uh, that wasn't there mm -hmm. prior to that person's entrance. Mm -hmm. And he hasn't said a word. Yeah. 
And sometimes that might be to do with the status of a person's role. Yeah. If they are formally the leader or the boss or whatever, then they might well be that have that impact. But sometimes it's even somebody who isn't has that kind of a psychological impact. And, and it can go either way. It can be somebody who walks into the room and everybody lights up and becomes more alive and more empowered. Sure. Yeah. I'm more and more interested in energy these days as uh, uh, something to be aware of and track and um, understand. That's, a, that's another whole talk. <laughs> <laughs> Diane, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm very intrigued by what you shared about um, uh, the social power and personal power. Uh, I'm wondering um, what would be a bystander's role uh, in this whole context? Oh, I love it when the group's way ahead of me or somebody in the group's way ahead of me. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely question, Pooja. We're going to come to it. I think sure. it's, it's a cue you. to move on. <laughs> okay. So what I want to um, talk about next, and I'll go back to screen share with a bit of luck. Where's my cursor disappeared to? There we go. Okay. I'm not for some reason getting my next screen thing. Why is that? What's happening? Um, can anybody help me tell me why my next slide isn't moving along? Oh, there we go. So I want to talk a little bit about power and powerlessness and trauma. Because trauma is generally identified as something as being traumatic when the person feels overwhelmed, either overwhelmed by the force of a tornado or a tsunami or someone else, or the force of the emotions that overwhelm them in reaction to the trauma. So in trauma, there's a sense of being overpowered, as I say, either by the, the natural event or by the person who's attacking or by something that happens, a larger person who hurts you. And with that comes the sense of powerlessness. And very often what goes with that, which trauma, people who've been experienced trauma point to, is a loss of dignity or worth and a sense of shame just by virtue of having been a victim of something particularly if they couldn't do anything to help themselves. Why didn't I hit back? Why didn't I run away? Why didn't I save somebody else who was next to me and they drowned? Why, why, why? The sense of shame. And this is sometimes internalized and often leads to um, illnesses or um, distress of some kind. Sometimes, however, it can be externalized, particularly if it's not resolved, it may be visited on somebody else. So for instance, somebody who is very much bullied at home uh, may bully at school because that powerlessness uh, is, and the loss of dignity and the shame, then when they are in a situation of relative power, they can externalize that and export the trauma, if you like. It's one way that we have of dealing with trauma as human beings. So I was thinking about this and I was thinking that this is a, a, a sort of straightforward process, but I wondered also about it going the other way, that even if there hasn't been some hugely traumatic event, simply the sense of being very powerless in a situation may in itself be traumatic and shaming. And I was thinking, for instance, how would I feel if I was a mother who was powerless to feed her child? 
simply because I didn't have food on me. I think I would feel traumatized. And certainly there would be a loss of dignity and possibly a sense of shame that went with it, even though it wasn't necessarily my fault. It may be for all sorts of external reasons, famine or inequity or whatever the case might be. Um, so just in itself, I'm proposing that um, trauma and shame are very closely linked and the sense of powerlessness and shame are closely linked and that it can in itself be traumatic. This is important for what I will come to later in trying to understand why some people will give up their power when they're already quite powerless, they'll give up what little power they have to the charge of someone else who offers to take care of them. So that sense of powerlessness might be due to poverty, social status, caste, race, faith, sexual orientation, or any other form of socially sanctioned denial of a person's personal power might in itself be a traumatic experience. I want now also to look at the spectrum of power. Power to be, power as self-affirmation. These are extensions of our definitions of power, really. Power as self-assertion, power as aggression, and power as violence. And I think we could readily agree that all of these are about energy. Um, and where our power is thwarted, um, the power to be, um, if someone is really threatening our existence and our power to be, we may well um, assert it as best we can, even to the level of aggression or possibly even to the level of violence, if we want to try to defend ourselves from an attack. Obviously that last point is an ethical consideration and some people wouldn't use violence under any circumstances, even if their life was threatened, but that is a, a personal choice and, and would be um, a choice of self-assertion and self-affirmation over one's power to be. In other words, I will die as I choose to die, not as you choose to make me die which is very powerful exercise of power. But all of these are um, spectrums of power. And um, I just, before we go on further on that, I'd like to see if there are any questions around the spectrum of power. So that's, can I stop the screen share or do you want it up while you talk? Do you need the reminder? Power to be, power is self-affirmation, power is selfish assertion, power is aggression, and power as violence. I'm going to stop the screen share and see if there are any questions or thoughts. I've got quite an individualistic thought, Di. Yes, go for it. I That's self-assertion. I don't know if this comes into your normal spectrum of questions, but what do you think of the power of Jewish people who feel it's important to survive in order not to give Hitler a posthumous victory? Well, there were a lot of Jewish people who were determined to survive even during the time of their greatest trial and did with extraordinary courage and um, tenacity in the face of God knows what, um, and even retained in some cases their capacity to be humane and to be human 
And that is, is almost beyond belief. So right now, I personally um, have no... Um, have no quarrel with wanting to, people to survive so as not to allow a posthumous victory. I think for me, the question would be at what cost? Yeah. That, that for me would be the question, but that's an ethical question and I can't answer that on behalf of Jewish people. I could only answer it for myself. Fair enough, fair enough. Any other thoughts? Um, just the first thing that came to my mind with Grace's question there was um, it almost feels a little bit like anti-script to me. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm wondering what the... Um, to me, the power would be in living your life as freely as possible. That would be my mm. personal kind of... That's mm. what my goal would be. And I'm wondering mm. if trying to survive is still being powerless in some way. I don't know if that makes sense. There's something about it that feels a little off to me. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. My question though that I had was around um, the idea of power as self-affirmation. I was just wondering what does that mean? I can't really wrap my head, wrap my head around it. Well, for instance, what what I said about if someone was attacking me violently, I think I would do everything I could to defend myself, including violence, if I had to. But for some people, not um, using violence is so important ethically and in terms of, or in terms of their religious beliefs or whatever, that they would not be willing to do that. And that would be a self-affirmation, that their self-affirmation their values and their sense of self would be more important to them even than, um, so they'd rather die in the way they chose to die than the way somebody else chose. You see what I mean? Mm. Mm. Yeah. That, so, that's, so it's self-affirming. Yes. That's an extreme example. We can do it all the time. We can affirm ourselves in, in, in other ways. Um, um, what you are um, talking about, uh, I think, relates a lot to the problems that people have when they have a severe illness, and it ties up with the ethics mm. of allowing mm. people to voluntarily yes. live a life yes. if they've got no yes. capacity to yes. stop the suffering. Mm, the right to die. Absolutely. Is an affirmation, a self affirmation. I agree with you. Thank you, Grace. It's a very clear example. So I think we need to move on. Um, I'm just keeping track of the time. Um, so I'm coming back to Steiner now. Let me go um, stop. I'll go back to share screen. Here we are. Um, oh. ah, and breathe again. Right, I'll keep you there for a moment while I give you Steiner's question. So Steiner has a challenge. He addresses it specifically to psychotherapists because he is one, but it applies to all transactional analysts. Acknowledging abuses of power would quickly lead most psychotherapists to the conclusion that as soul healers, they must become advocates of those that are being oppressed rather than simply neutral observers who take no sides or bystanders, as we might say. As a consequence, because they would have to take sides with the powerless against the powerful, therapists are not too eager to become aware of such power factors. So that's a strong challenge to us all. So how are we to answer Steiner's challenge? Professionally, we have power 
and can use it to empower, overpower or underpower our clients, trainees and others. In society, we have skills that can be used in the interests of defending our TA values and principles of I'm okay, you're okay, we're okay, they're okay, and the environment is okay. Or we can stand by those who are violated, stand by while those are violated. We can become involved in power plays and drama triangles, or we can use our power authentically to challenge imbalances or abuse. And the, this might be in the arena of family, community, professional organizations, faith groups, or political institutions. Um, and I'm going to go on in a short while to talk about um, authoritarianism and autocratic power, which is the real grabbing of power by one person or a small group of people at the expense of others and how and why that happens and how we can understand it. But I think now would be a good time. I said round about three o'clock, we're a bit early to take our little um, comfort break, have a stretch. Grace has just done that. I encourage you all to do that briefly. Um, get some water, visit the loo, whatever you need to do um, for five minutes. Is that adequate? Thank you.
Okay, are we all back? Um, I remind people to switch to put their um, audio on mute while they're not talking to stop background noise. Thank you. Okay. Oh no, I'm going to stay there. Um, so. What was part of the stimulus for me in getting going on this issue of power was being invited to speak at a, the keynote speaker for the multi-level learning in India. But it was also because I had been doing a lot of thinking about the um, hyperpolarization of views and the intolerance and the rigidity that so many groups seem to be displaying at the moment is that there's a real divide. And I saw this particularly playing out in um, the USA and in the UK with Brexit. And there seemed to be a rising intolerance and rigidity and scapegoating, whether it was immigrants or um, whoever. And discounting of reality in many parts of the world as various groups were vying for power and control. Each determined that they were right and that the other was not only wrong, but worthless. And um, I think this, this has been within the democracies, this has been most obvious in the USA where Ex-President Trump made a serious bid for autocratic power. But there's also some move in that direction or upsurge of uh, anti-democratic movements in the UK, in Germany, where there's a rise of neo-Nazism, and in Brazil, to name just a few. In South Africa, we have our own challenges from both from traditional quarters and from supposedly revolutionary quarters, and from those seeking to exploit racial differences. I don't know much about Indian politics to comment in detail, but I do know that many of my friends and colleagues there are concerned about the emphasis on religious and ethnic divisions and growing social inequalities. And we can see that playing out now in, as well in this terribly stressful and distressing time for India with COVID and what's happening there. So I urge us all to take a little time at some point in our lives to hold India in heart and mind. So it is in this context of severe challenges around the world and what are our freedoms and what are our powers and all of that, that a sense of urgency that I want to talk about the abuse of power at a social level and how we might counteract it. Autocratic power shows us the extreme form of power concentrated in the hands of a leader and his, his followers. I say his advisedly because so far most of them have been his's, but it doesn't rule out the possibility that a woman could do the same. And the disempowerment of everyone else. Autocratic power requires aggression and violence, if you remember our spectrum of power, or the threat thereof at least, in order to limit any challenges that may arise from people outside the system. Within autocratic power systems, the power to be, the power of self-affirmation, and the power of self-assertion are discouraged or denied to any people not belonging to the power group. And Alan Jacobs is the TA author that I'm going to look at for some analysis on how this works and why it succeeds. This is his diagram on the master follower projection system. And of course, it's also a, an indication of a symbiotic system, which those of you who Will, are looking for TAA theory will notice. So on the left, we have the master whose position is I'm okay, you're not okay. But of course that okayness is conditional. 
it's on conditional on somebody else being not okay. The follower, on the other hand, says, I'm not okay, but you are, O oh master, who will save me from myself. So between them, they can project the not okayness onto the source of all evil, whatever it might be. In the case of the Nazis, it was the Jews and the communists and the gypsies and disabled people. And um, in the case of more recently of Donald Trump, it was mainly the immigrants and the Mexicans who were coming across taking jobs and being a problem in a war was needed. So here we have a beautiful example, unfortunately, of between the follower and the master, they can make a system that says we are okay. They're not okay, but we're okay. You're okay, and I'm okay as long as you're making me okay, so we are just fine. And all that is feared can be projected onto the, the source of all evil. And the system is based on fear. Fear of their own okayness, not okayness, even the master has a sense of the not okayness that he needs to get rid of, fear of loss of control, fear of each other, because it's a precarious symbiosis, you never know, quite know when the master might turn on you, fear of actually becoming that evil thing. So um, one finds this in, say, homophobia, um, that the projection of my own tendency towards femininity or homosexuality might be projected onto the hated other and they carry it for me. And this, the willingness of people to do this, I am suggesting, is an expression of how shamed, humiliated, fearful, traumatized, they might have been at some point in their lives or currently still are. I think uh, Trump's appeal was particularly to people who felt that they had been, and perhaps absolutely had, been neglected within the American system. Um, their livelihoods had diminished, their power had diminished in various ways, and he was going to make them great again. And at the expense of those others who were uh, problematic. Um, he also looks at, uh, there, there we have the next part, which is the symbiosis. So we're okay together. We can pool our okay bits and we can believe that we are just fine as long as though the others can carry all our, any aspects of human not okayness can be projected onto them. He also identifies other roles within this. Here you are, here's the bystanders. Passively support the master followers program and, and that system from within. We didn't know what was happening. We didn't see anything. We don't know. We are just there. We had that in we have that in many situations, from the Bible and the story of the Good Samaritan, right through to all the other awful in, events in human history where many people have been bystanders. Slaves. These are outside the system and are deemed less human or even non-humans, and they are simply there to be exploited. This was true of many colonial systems, unfortunately. Um, like in the Congo, uh, the whole system there was that a few chiefs and a few people were taken in as um, 
authorities within the colonial system and everybody else was seen to be um, pretty much non-human and up for exploitation. Um, and I don't, I mean, all the colonial powers, they all did that, not just the Belgians. Um, the uh, resistors, these are the, those who stand up and fight against the master followers, but all too often maintain the autocratic system just in another form. And I think this is really important because the, um, this is why so many liberation movements fail to yield the kind of liberty that people dreamed of. You might remember that Trump initially presented himself as a resistor. He was going to drain the swamp of corruption in Washington and reclaim power for ordinary Americans and make them all great again. It was soon clear for all to see that his own autocratic interests took precedence um, over all of that, really. Um, and look, and so what we have is a situation where many people who, not all, they are resistors who are real resistors. Unfortunately, they often get assassinated, either by their own side or by the people that they are resisting. They have a, a poor survival rate. And the, those who become, uh, develop an autocratic system just of their own, explains why we can find authoritarian personality types on, if you like, both sides of the spectrum, the conservative side and the supposedly revolutionary side, because they are all setting up a, effectively an autocratic system where either you're with me or you're against me. And if you're against me, then you're out. Um, and this polarization begins to take place and this level of intolerance um, where one side is willing to use violence against the other, if need be, to impose their views. Um, I'm just thinking, I think this would be a good time before I go on to anything else to take a pause and have questions and discussion. Right. So any thoughts or questions? Does the projection system make sense to you? Um, and, yeah, Guy. Mm -hmm. I mean that that projection system is such a explains how power, real um, autocratic power comes to be. That it, it's not something that operates in a vacuum. It actually requires, you know, people who believe they're not okay mm. um, to accept that that system, and mm. then. You know, that third aspect, I find that very interesting if we think about South Africa during apartheid. Um, and you can look at it in so many ways. And that if you create a system where I'm okay, you're not okay. And then the other party agrees with that and goes, you're right, I'm not okay, you're okay. And then we band together against another group. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I just find that really interesting from that perspective. Mm. And it's it just indicative of how power works, really, isn't it? That well, it's, certainly, you can be powerful on your own, yeah. but you're way more powerful when that interaction takes place. Yeah, and you're way more powerful in certain ways if you're willing to use violence and aggression, or at least a threat of them, yeah. to create a police state, as was yeah. hap has happened with apartheid, where mm. it... It, even those who then wanted to resist, I, I couldn't, were either arrested yeah. or imprisoned. Mm -hmm. or, so once mm -hmm. the 
once an autocratic power can seize enough power, then it's very hard for anybody to resist. There still were people yeah. who resisted, but it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, there were just so many different things that happened, and in many, in some instances, um, some people um, supported the apartheid system, who you would have thought would have resisted it mm. against, so a different group, for instance, mm. you know, mm. that whole kind of thing. Yeah, and it, it's, this is also making me think of a time when I, I gave a lift to someone and. That's what it was about, but I gave him a lift and he was from the Congo and I was asking him what had brought him here to South Africa and he looked at me and he had a strange look on his face and he said, there's no work in the Congo. And then he said, there's no whites in the Congo, so there's mm. no work. Mm. And there's that bought mm. into belief mm. of not okayness that mm. I was so, I'll never forget it. Mm. And thinking that he, his entire life is informed by the idea that if there are no whites in the country, there are no jobs in the country, full stop. Mm -hmm. um, something about that in this whole power thing came to mind. Yep. And, and it's also why people who have no sense of their own worth will allow themselves to mm -hmm. elect dictators who then exactly. um, oppress them and yeah. That's the answer I've sometimes had from people from the Congo. Well, look at our government and look at the yeah. corruption. Yeah, so that's the them. Mm. Yeah. Okay, any other thoughts? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm observing that in this projection system, the master follower. Um, so like you shared earlier about overpowered um, underpowered and empowered. So there are only um, the overpowered and underpowered uh, present. Mm. There is no empowerment at all. Nice observation, Pooja. Absolutely. Empowered people are a serious threat <laughs> to most governments. <laughs> particularly autocratic ones. <laughs> Anything else? So there's a sense, Di, that I'm getting is that if we're not, if we're not open to work with our shadow, uh, we claim a quick fix of autocratic power and just project that out. And I wonder if that's a first stage of becoming empowered if people have been formally disempowered and that's the gap where there's no opportunity to do that work. So it just get, gathers its own momentum as autocratic power, but it's almost the, the fuel to become empowerment or is that just an idealistic it's dream? It's a very, very good question, Holding. Karen. Um, I think you, you raise a really important point that if, it's, if the if the shift doesn't take place around, I'm not okay. If I'm not okay and I'm resisting from a not okay position, yeah. almost I've done the flip side of the corner. Well, I've now switched, I'm okay, but you're not okay. If I'm resisting from that position, I'm going to create the same system. Mm. It's just turned around. Exactly, exactly. And I will find other people who, to be not okay, whether it's white people or Indians or um, men or whoever, to be not okay is the flip side of that same system. Um, that's how I understand it. And so the healing and the empowerment takes place where people can integrate the shadow, overcome the healing and the trauma and, and stand in an I'm okay, you're okay, we're okay together place. And as I say, those are the real resistors who could manage that, um, like Nelson Mandela, like Chris Harney, um, who criticized the ANC from within, was even imprisoned by the ANC itself at one stage. Um, so th that's where 
that's where I see, unless there's fundamental change, you just get flip change. Or you get polarization of two flip changes. <laughs> One side versus the other. With no, oh, I, yeah, Alex. As you mentioned that, I'm thinking then about the balance or, or the line between autonomy and homonymy, because when you're criticizing the group to which you belong, you're being autonomous. Mm. Or would you uh, would you agree with that? Yes, I, th I I do agree with that, and I think it's one of the hardest things to do, actually, to step outside the group that you are that is your home, and face the prospect of being disowned because you um, you you stand for something different, or you're challenging from within. Yeah. So surely psychologically there must always be an aspect of self which is autonomous in order to be able to detect where there's a disagreement or a misalignment with the group or to get around phenomena like group think well that is um if we think developmentally in historical terms autonomy is quite a, re a recent um, invention. In fact, it's a very recent invention. Um, in not even that long ago, if your father was a tailor, you were a tailor, and that was it. And if your father was a particular caste, you were a particular caste, and that was it. Um, and there was no sense of um, personal choice. Uh, and if you were born a Catholic, you died a Catholic and you never had any other choice from that. So all of these things are relatively new um, inventions. I don't know if I'd agree with that. I think the Buddha pretty much exemplifies. Um, oh, the, no, I'm, I'm not talking about the that's mystics. That's an ancient concept. Oh, I'm not talking about the mystics. The mystics all transcended all of that way, way, way ahead of the rest of us. I'm talking about social organization, even in Buddhist culture in terms of social organization, there you have limited autonomy in how you organize your society. Um, it's very recent that the Buddhists accepted women, monks, for instance, or nuns, as they call them. It was totally unthought of at one time. Um, so the person's autonomy to choose. Hey, I'm a woman. I want to be a, a nun. Uh, uh No, thanks. That wasn't allowed within the social organization. So yeah, the mystics were always way ahead of all of us. Thank goodness. Um, um, yeah. Then maybe I've misunderstood what you mean when you say autonomy is relatively new, because it's a concept. I think it's been around since uh, the beginning, which is what the mystics have modeled. Yes. I mean, Jesus did that too. Absolutely, absolutely. And I agree with you, they modeled their own personal power and autonomy. Um, Christ to the point of standing out and criticizing his own uh, birth religion and forming an, and a new one formed around him. But he, he was a Jew and he remained a Jew. Um, but he's, they, they tend People like that, as I say, tend to get assassinated. Um, and that's, but the mystics have always led the way. So yes, authority, um, um, autonomy, but as it's used in terms of autonomy and homonymy in social terms, then I would say it's, it's a, a relatively new concept to be able to be both. but I uh, take your point entirely. Any other comments here? And this, um, this, this discussion keeps on making me think of the um, Stanford prison experiment um, where, and I, I, the movie is on Netflix if any of you have, have want to watch it, but it's horrible to watch. Yes, I don't advise watching it. Me, yeah. 
about this the, that experiment is that there was one well in the yeah there seemed to be one particularly um, dangerous man who took control as a god and started to mete out punishment. And what fascinated me was how the other gods who could have easily stopped it, it was an experiment after all, did not. Hmm. Um, and I wonder where would they, they would, I guess, fall into that, I'm not okay, you're okay. Uh, there was something about them that was so disempowered and he wasn't disempowering them though, you know? But that when there is somebody in the room who is extremely powerful and aggressive, even if and the aggression scary. hasn't aimed at ourselves, yeah, yeah, even if it's they're aggressive towards somebody else, I suppose, again, that, that I like this model you've given us, because, again, everyone else in the room who isn't being attacked goes, oh, thank God it's not me, keeps quiet, lets the aggression take place, and out of self-preservation, lets it happen against somebody else in the room. Mm. I, I guess that's how that occurs. Mm. And is terrified to stand up because then it might turn around and be projected at them. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank God it really isn't me. Yep. Yeah, because yep. it's so easy for us to say, you know, if I saw that, I would never have let that happen. I would say something. But you know, when you're in the midst of it, it it's a different story. And it is why people get away with what they get away with. Mm. Yeah. And I, I can still remember in South Africa, the fear of stepping outside of the boundaries and effectively becoming an outlaw. Yeah. As far as the state was concerned, the protection of the state no longer applied to you. Yeah. Wow. And the protection of your group no longer applied to you. Um, that was very, that's a frightening position to be Amazing. in. Amazing. Yeah. 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 And I wasn't brave enough to go to jail, so I left the country. But many people went to jail or died. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I think perhaps we can move on from there to, we must, we can't talk about the bystander without mentioning Patricia Clarkson. So here we are. Um, just to give a little more time to the bystander. Um, hang on. Nope. That's the authoritarian personality. I'm not going to spend time on that. Here's the, um, this is Patricia Clarkson's contribution to the, um, the drama triangle, um, where we have the historical backdrop against which this is taking place and the audience or bystanders. And they are literally watching what happens, what takes place. Now, I'm not going to go into this in great detail because while the drama triangle certainly is enacted in many situations that we can be looking at, um, I'm interested now in situations where we're not actually focusing on a drama triangle. We're focusing on a real life social situation where there may be drama triangle being played out as well, but where there really are persecutors with a small p, victims with a small v, and rescuers with a small r, in situations that are not just psychological dramas, but are actual real life situations um, where there are people who are literally being put into camps or um, like the Myanmar or recently even in the US on the other, wrong side of the border wall, children being imprisoned. Um, and so th that's what I'm interested in at the moment. And I would submit that any society, let's just move on, where there are serious power imbalances rising from wealth, status, educational opportunity, 
Many people will experience their power to be, to affirm themselves and to assert themselves very restricted. This is true even if the society is not highly autocratic. But of course, the more autocratic it becomes, the harder it is to make any changes. And so as transactional analysts in our various fields, will we be bystanders or active participants in these kind of situations in our own societies, wherever we may be living and working? And what might our roles be? We obviously don't want to become rescuers, persecutors, or victims with capital, with capital letters in terms of the drama triangle. So I'd like now for us to look at some authentic roles. And I particularly like the authentic roles as uh, expressed by Gordon Law in his um, system. He looks at the beholder instead of the bystander. And the, by the beholder may not be able to do anything to change the suffering that is happening or intervene to stop the persecutors. But the beholder can be a witness, an active witness. And that is an important human capacity. And I'm thinking, for instance, it is sometimes held, not always, but sometimes held by um, journalists. Sometimes they're just there for the for the excitement, but very often journalists go into dangerous and difficult situations to take photographs, to tell stories, to bear witness to the suffering of the people in those situations. Sometimes observers are sent in by the UN to come back with reports to see what, what can be done. And that's an important thing. Even if we can't be active, we can be an active witness not somebody who doesn't see or doesn't hear. Responder, instead of being a rescuer, how to be a responder to the needs of the victims. Again, looking at a war or, or a, a traumatic event, we have people like the Red Cross, uh, the Red Crescent, um, and many people, individuals, will step up to see what they can do to help. I think it was remarkable during the recent COVID crisis and also the recent fire, um, how many people stepped up to respond appropriately to the needs of victims. Promoter, to bring about change and, and put an end to the oppression. That's something that is perhaps more challenging in an everyday life situation. Um, it might be that in a, uh, again, in a civil war situation, peacekeeping forces might be sent in. They may be promoters. Hostage negotiators could be sent in to, to talk and to find some sort of change in resolution. It might even involve sending in troops. In terms of our own lives, how do we, what can we do to be a promoter? about change and end oppression where we see it. How can we speak out? What can we do? Um, instead of being a victim, um, Gordon proposes a valuer, someone to promote healing and allow self to be impacted too. Um, there one might think of people who um, volunteer to go into refugee camps to do trauma work or to run groups for the children and who actually live there and allow themselves to be impacted and to work with healing, to become actually part of the, the vulnerable, but in a way that is valuing themselves and others and the role of, of those people. So I really like those ways of offering us an option for how we um, how we can respond. And 
also how we can be active. And I'm thinking in these very polarized um, one side against the other situations we have at the moment. These are very valuable roles to hold. How can we simply witness the other, the other side of the story? How can we respond to it? How we, can we promote change? How can we value ourselves and others within a situation? Our views and the views of others, even when we disagree. I'm going to stop sharing there and invite discussion. How are you all doing? How's your energy? It's hard to tell when you're not in a room with people. <laughs> Any thoughts? I've got some thoughts, Di, which of a somewhat general nature, um, and they're thoughts which are contemporary, because not only is this time different to all other times, because we are undergoing a pandemic, we also undergoing an existential climate emergency. Mm. And I was so shocked this week when I read that my favorite climate journalist, whose name is Eric Holtzhaus, admitted not only was he going for psychological help because of his climate anxiety, but that it had got so disabling that he was actually going on to medication. And it made me so aware of the potential mental crisis of people who are victims of climate emergency. And I don't know what TA has got to offer to the conundrum, but those are just the thoughts that are going through my mind. Very important thought, Grace. Um, and oh, all of those value, all those authentic roles we can use all of them in relation Absolutely. to climate change. Absolutely. And need to, and need to. Oh, I mean, it is such a complex problem and it actually encompasses politics and economics and sociology mm. and every possible mm. sphere of expertise to come to some sort of working together of humanity in a way um, that it never has before, which yeah. also sort of brings to mind the concept which has also become so omnipresent in the past 12 months, is that we are all so interdependent. Yeah. And I'm not quite sure how, again, TA would look at the degrees of interdependence that each and every one of us share. I, I think it I think it to some extent relates to homonymy, but it's bigger than that. Um, I think it comes to essence and to um, physis, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a necessity to work together in a way never before. And I mean, also the distribution of vaccines. Again, you know, the rich countries need to support the poorer countries. The I'm okay people need to support the less okay people because if the less okay people don't come right, then the- They're not less okay people. They're people with- more severe set of challenges. Yep. Any any further? Yes, Andrew. Um, so, um, 
this uh, Gordon Law's work is brand new to me and I'm quite enjoying it. Um, it's tickling mm. my brain nicely. Um, the um, something that before you introduce that, when you're talking about um, Patricia Parkson's work with the bystander, um, what was coming to my mind at that time is um, social roles from um, Le Pyrrhonic. Mm. And I, what, what I've enjoyed in my journey with the, the triangles in this regard is going from the, um, the drama triangle to the winner's triangle and then to social roles. And there was um, like um, bringing more nuance through, through mm. that sort of continuum. Um, and something that I really enjoyed with that. Um, and I'm looking forward to spending more time thinking about with Law's work is something that I've always felt really stuck with, with um, the winner's triangle be, being like the, the antithesis and the positive um, that you need to strive for coming out of a drama triangle is that it felt quite stuck. Um, and so like you, you're, you're gonna be standing on one of these points but then when I started to learn about the social roles, it felt far more nuanced. And you could almost in one interaction with somebody, you could be on a continuum between uh, different points on the, the mm. social roles triangle. Mm. Mm. Um, so some, mm. and I like that. I, I like that because I, when I think about myself and I have felt the most sort of potent, potent, courageous, and vulnerable at different times, mm. and even in the same time, um, I've been able to sort of dance in the moment mm. um, and move around with, and see myself mm. in those different times and between uh, different points and between points. And mm. um, yeah, so that, that was coming mm. to my mind. So I'm looking forward to spending more. Um, Great. Well, I, I hope you will read Gordon's work. book. It's um, it's a tome and a half, and I think I'm one of the half dozen people who've read it all the way through. But it is brilliant stuff. Um, and your point about being stuck is exactly why I never use the winner's um, triangle. I don't like it. I draw it as a win as a healthy circle, and I draw the roles in a circle with arrows interacting between them, going round. Um, uh, that's for exactly that reason. I don't like that sort of stuckness of it, as it were. Um, and actually, one stands at the center and uses all of those roles. Um, but Gordon's Gordon's work is very interesting, and it's all, it's he has very complex diagrams which are all in fours, including the bystander always. So they're quadrants going up and down at all sorts of levels and it's absolutely fascinating stuff. So if you want to borrow the book, I'm happy to lend it to you, but um, <laughs> be warned, <laughs> it's a tome. <laughs> any, any other things there? I'm just keeping track of the time, we're all right. Any further questions, Karen? Um, I, I'm struck by the quality of the words that, that Gordon uses, um, beholder, responder, promoter and valuer they've got a gentleness mm. and a presence about them even though they are extremely powerful mm. and i'm thinking you've spoken about mystical um the mystical sense of who we are almost it's that invitation to to go within and pop into that universal mm. experience that is only oneness mm. and come from that place so it's that our personal inner work is going to help mm. us come from that place and be really really potent and yeah. uh, um, Stein is sources of power and I'm thinking you might be ending with that I am <laughs> okay it's what it's calling out for yeah so. yeah thank you as I said I love it when people in the group are zipping ahead and know where we're going and got all these ideas so we'll we'll move right on then we'll return to Steiner and uh, I'll do share screen again. And breathe. That's to me, remind me to breathe as much as you. These are Claude Steiner's um, 
So I'll just say in his, um, in later life, um, Claude Steiner proposed, in, went on to develop what he saw as seven sources of power based on the seven chakras. And he wrote quite a lot about how control was overvalued in our society. And he wanted to look at the other sources of power as being more significant and valuable. So they are grounding, passion, control, love, communication, knowledge, and transcendence. All of these, which in a way we have touched on, um, grounded in our being, active in our passions. Control here, I would see as much about self-control as it's about controlling our environment or other people. That might sometimes mean that too. Love, which goes through everything, and which is the opposite of the fear that the autocratic power loves so much. Communication, empowering ourselves and others through communication. Knowledge, again, connecting and empowering. And then of course, transcendence, which is the mystical and spiritual aspect of ourselves. Um, all the way through the seven chakras. And um, I just want to um, say so Tudor in his latest um, biography of um, Claude Steiner, which is very interesting to read. He criticizes him for what he sees as Steiner's abandonment of his old political stance and his social power and all of that stuff. But I personally think that is a bit misplaced, that criticism, because I think, we've talked about it all the way through, social systems are made up of individuals, personal power and social power completely interconnected. They're not separate, they're not different. And all social systems are made up of individual human beings, ultimately. And autocratic power can only be maintained if the master can find enough followers or bystanders or slaves to operate the system. And again, I'm returning to Claude Steiner, who says the greatest antidote to authoritarian power is for people to develop individual power in its multi-dimensional forms and to dedicate themselves to passing on power to as many others as can be found in a lifetime. How's that for a wonderful ambition? And as a transactional analyst, I am pleased and proud to consider that that is largely what we do. That is what our work is about. And ultimately, the current struggles for power that dominate the social media and our screens are, I believe, quite simply put, a battle between the power of love and the power of fear. The Frangipanis in my PowerPoint presentation are in Swahili culture, a symbol of love. And we all know their sweet fragrance. Love is in itself an antidote to fear. Nonetheless, I submit we also need to cultivate courage. The courage to assert our own power and empower others. The courage to speak truth to power when power overreaches itself. And that's the end of my presentation with lots of time for more questions or comments.
Diane, I've got a, a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, how would you uh, relate uh, the concept of power to, to leadership? Mm -hmm. I think leadership is a very interesting um, subject. And whenever my husband's going on about leaders and how important it is to train leaders, I say, well, what about the followers? How about training and followership? <laughs> and my point being that um, leaders are always leading somebody. And that's, that's the nature of a leader is that they're out there leading somebody or leading some program or whatever. And I think the quality of the followers and the leaders are very interdependent. An autocratic leader will want certain types of followers and have certain types of followers. And another kind of leader will want and have other types of people who are following them. And the, it's also leadership for what is the, my other question that I always want to ask. Is this leadership in a time of peace or leadership in a time of war? Leadership of something new or leadership of something established? So always it's calling for different qualities, but always I would say it's calling for the healthy use of power, which I would say is all those sources of power that we've just been talking about now. So I would see a leader as needing to develop all of those qualities. It's a long answer. Yeah, I, um, I, uh, I was fortunate to, uh, to be lectured to by a very, very clever lady at the University of Minnesota, Professor Miriam Kragness. She is uh, uh, one of the experts uh, in, the con in the context of leadership. Uh, and she was commissioned to uh, do some research uh, for a particular American company, uh, taking all the research that has been done and what has been published. And she, uh, she, when she announced the uh, results of her research to us, she said she took a very different stance because if you look at most of the research and publications on leadership, uh, there seems to be a tendency to draw a profile of leaders, uh, as you said, in various kinds and various different situations. Uh, but she, uh, she, she made a very interesting point and she said, uh, may I just remind you that leaders have followers, mm -hmm. uh, point one. And, 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 and she said, it's, it's the only skill that's very different from any other other skills because it requires lead, leadership or it requires followership ex, uh, acceptance. Mm. And she made a very strong point where she said leadership and followership are basically one, the, just the, the two sides of the same coin. And, and therefore, if you bring the power issue into the equation, uh, I'm just trying to try to relate to what you were talking about power, it is, it is the ability to empower people in a sense. Um, doesn't matter what, what the circumstances are, uh, you've got different, I suppose, different um, ways of, of, of leading. But in essence, uh, you know, why would I follow you? Um, because I feel uh, empowered, as it were, in some sense or the other. So the, the, the issue of power, uh, I, I found with a lot of companies, uh, but sometimes uh, twisted because it appears to be that uh, the more position power you have, uh, the more powerful you become in a sense. And that's where the whole, uh, I think the whole concept of the, uh, the power issue becomes completely blurred in a sense and autocratic power uh, almost uh, rears its ugly head. Um, but the, the essence of what I'm really saying is that it seems that there is power in the follower and there's power in the leader as well. And, and the two combined uh, is, is really where the, the, the challenges are. Mm. 
I, I think there's truth in that. And, and I, one of the things that I would say about leaders and followers is it depends very much on the mix you've got. Two things always rise to the top. In really good, healthy milk, the cream rises to the top and your leaders will be the best. In a really scummy mixture of trauma and fear, <coughs> you get the worst rising to the top and you get the leaders that come out of that kind of mix. <coughs> so it's the social bowl is also important as to what the followers and the leader are like, in, in my view. The container, what it contains, healthy or unhealthy mix. Any other thoughts? So uh, thank you. This has been great. Uh, I just have a thought around around power and followers um, in in terms of of the obviously the 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 leader or or the power can only exist if there are followers. Power has to be given by um, it, it it cannot just necessarily be claimed. Um, while some people do, there has to be a level of I give the leader power and there's power that exists within that, um, that the, you know, the, that my ability to give a leader power is a powerful pos position within me as well. And I just kind of was reflecting on that in terms of the kind of made me think about respect, you know, and that respect is earned. And we so often when Johan, you were speaking about leaders and leaders, leadership and, and, and respect often go so hand in hand. Mm. Um, and the, and I, I was recently reading that how leadership isn't, how respect isn't earned, respect is given. And I've just been reflecting on that as you, as you've been speaking, it's just mm. the power of giving um, somebody power and the power that kind of almost latently and inherently exists within that. It's just a thought that's come to mind. I'm not sure what to do with it, but, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure if that makes sense, but that's kind of what I'm thinking is, is that power has so many, it, it, it just, there's so many kind of um, layers to it mm -hmm. that exists in terms of who has the power, who gives the power and the power to give power. Mm -hmm. And, and also institutions that protect power, both yeah. for good or ill. I'm thinking of our constitution, for instance, which really protects the power of our courts and the power of the individual citizens um, and empowers us very strongly to in what we are, what our rights are, what our responsibilities are and all of that. Um, so there are many ways in society in which we either can have our power removed from us or take our own power or give up our own power. Yeah. Thank you. Any further? No? Well, I think it looks as though we are at an end. So thank you very much for um, being part of this discussion today. And I will let um, Kirsty have the list of references for you and she'll be able to send it on. If anybody would like the um, slides, I'm happy to share them, um, provided if you use them, you credit me. Um, and the other people that I've credited. Um, yeah. So I'm once more scanning our committee. I saw Alex, you'd unmuted. Andrew, final words, Kirsty. Going to say thank you to Di. Um, you've really delivered on your promise and in the uh, write-up for the event with a diverse uh, array of authors and models and ideas. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Good. Thank you. I'm aware that we're finishing a little early, but I don't think people will complain. 
um, I had allowed in more time because I thought we were going to have breakaway groups and they always take up time. But since we didn't have to, we were a bit ahead of ourselves. <laughs> So maybe a, a final word, thanks to the, the new people who've joined us for the first time. Sheetal, mm. I know we've connected in another forum. Lovely to have you here. Como, I haven't met you before, but you're very welcome. And please come back, uh, check on our website to see what else is up and coming. We've got some um, more webinars from people from further afield lands. And we've got another in our in our dialect in Afrikaans, we're calling this local as lacquer. So Diane, you've been our first local. Local is lovely or nice. And Marguerite is offering us something later in the year. So get your voice involved uh, in what you want um, to get from the SATAA. We're, we're quite a nice bunch of people, I think, uh, that have really <laughs> uh, authentic conversations and uh, interactions. So yeah. Lovely to be here. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm delighted to see so many new people, which is lovely, new to me. <laughs> okay, thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for your profile. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Pleasure. Bye. 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 Bye.